All right, go ahead and do chapter nine. Make sure we're on there, right? So this is the chapter on magazines. So let's go through this pretty quickly if we can. This will also be on the test and for the remote people who have essays related to this chapter. So magazines and the age of specialization. Um, one of the things that we really did um, change in the in the current spectrum in terms of magazines is we have sort of fixer upper magazines magnolia market magnolia homes magnolia realty but here's an example of what people want in today's magazine market so the magnolia journal is a quarterly lifestyle magazine that marks the first print extension of joanna and chip Gaines powerhouse magnolia brand inspiring readers to create their best homes families and lives while making Every moment count, the magazine covers entertaining, seasonally driven celebrations, outdoor living, family food, healthy lifestyles, and more, all showcased through the um, and signature rustic back to our roots aesthetic and focus on idea rich content that encourages readers to dive in and try something new. I think that's a bit wordy. It's obviously a run on sentence. But again, that's what today's market really is um, looking for in terms of a specialty market. So that's really the, um, what's happening now is the Cornerstone brands out in West Gentry is a perfect example that they publish a magazine that has a lot of tips and also has all the products. They sell high-end products. So we actually in Butler County, we have a company that does that. So how did it all get started? Again, the first magazines were a collection of articles, stories, advertisements that appeared in non-daily periodicals. They were either weekly or monthly. Again, they were small tabloid style rather than broadsheet newspaper style. Um, first example would be The Review, which was a political magazine that um, appeared in London in 1704. It was edited by Daniel um, Defoe, who's famous in literature, printed sporadically until 1713. And other magazines that were really from that same time period would be The Tattler, The Spectator, and Gentleman's um, Magazine. A lot of serial, they had serial stories from famous authors and they would have all sorts of information in them that was related to um, the ones were particularly not political, but there were some did have the Tattler and Spectator obviously did have some political content. So in colonial America, magazines sort of developed slowly. They served politicians, the educated merchant class, but they did document early American life. So they are good to go back in perspective to see what was going on at that time frame. So the first colonial magazine was really in 1741, and that was called the American Magazine. And there was also a general magazine, Historical Chronicle. So by about 1776, we had about 100 magazines in the colonies that were, um, again, a lot of them obviously on, published on the East Coast in the big cities. So how did the magazines grow over time? And again, the magazine industry in the 19th century, um, it sort of slowed after the revolution partially due to high delivery costs. And still, but most communities did have their own weekly magazine by about 1825. Um, I'm not sure about Hamilton. I always wanted to look up some of that in terms of, since this was a fort, I'm sure that we did have some community news uh, magazine in, in the early 1800s, but I really have to go check on that because I didn't really remember anything about it. Um, specialized magazines also emerged, um, religious, literary, and professional. So they were geared towards particular niches. The first general interest magazine was the Saturday Evening Post, which lasted a long time into the 2000s. So the other thing that really sort of grew was national and women's and illustrated magazines. So magazines that had images or graphics in them were popular. So the, the growth of the magazine market improved literacy and public education. Again, they had better printing due to um, procedures and things changing with, in terms of the printing presses and technology getting better. So again, post technology got better too in terms of delivery. So one of the first um, magazines focused towards women was Ladies Magazine. Um, it was basically all the material in it was focused towards the female audience. Um, so Ladies Magazine, it merged with Goody's Ladies Book. Um, sort of, I think that was in the mid 1840s, I wanna say. It helped to educate lower and middle class women that were denied higher education. So the people that didn't get to go to school and again, just had a public education one through eighth or whatever, they had an opportunity to, to gain access to this type of magazine. 
So then modern American magazines, we, as we push forward past the um, Civil War, the Postal Act of 1879 lowered the postal rates, the magazine circulations increased. So advertisers jumped on board too. They were making money from this too, both the advertisers and the, the magazines themselves. So the advertisers used magazines to captain, capture attention and build a national marketplace. And one of the first magazines that was really um, large in terms of its scope with a circulation of, of 1 million was Ladies Home Journal, which again was focused towards women. So the other thing that happened sort of in the late 1800s into the 1900s, um, the rise in circulation coincided with the, the social changes that were happening. So journalists were allowed to write in depth um, about issues. So there could be a story in a magazine that was you know, fairly long. Um, also, we had the muckrakers, the investigative journalists that they did uh, raise awareness leading to Pure Drug and um, Food and Drug Act, Meat Inspection Act and the antitrust laws. So if you remember the jungle by Sinclair and Lewis, this is that time frame which was famous in terms of um, actually trying to help the consumer to a certain extent, which led to these, some of the, the bad practices that were going on, particularly in Chicago is one of the meatpacking industries, what um, the jungle was written about. So also the rise of the general interest magazines, um, they combined investigative journalism with broad national topics. They were prominent after World War I through the 1950s. This included the Saturday Evening Post, the Reader's Digest, Time, Life, um, I'm still excited about some of those magazines because some of the famous photojournalism that when I went to school in New York, um, we focused on that, some of the first photographers who were famous. Um, and again, they used photos to document the rhythms of daily life and it gave magazines sort of an advantage over radio. So people did like looking at the imagery that was in these um, magazines. It also had a pass along readership. So the total number of people who came in contact with a single copy was much bigger than the circulation itself. So obviously libraries had them, schools had them. You could go to the school library, sit down and, and read a, a magazine, which I did in seventh, eighth, ninth grade. I remember doing that. So the fall of the general um, interest magazines really kind of started around the 50s because we had a lot of change in consumer taste. The postal rates went up again. The ad revenues went down and they were competing against television. So that changed a little bit in terms of the, the landscape of magazines at that point. One of the bigger ones that did um, benefit from television was TV Guide. It highlighted the interest in specialized magazines. And again, checkout lines at the, at the store, people would buy them there and they also had circulations. It also proved that the, the power of television was really big because people wanted to know in terms of what was gonna be on. They had little stories about uh, celebrities and stuff, usually some sort of photo on the front that had a celebrity. Um, it's very similar today what, what your guide is on a TV actually sort of named after a TV guide. That's why they call them the guide on your spectrum or whatever. So the other one was the Saturday Evening Post, Life and Look. They all did fold. Eventually they did last up until I think almost the late 90s, early 2000s. Again, they sold issues at a loss to maintain circulation figures. But the ad dollars became split with TV, so they weren't getting as much advertising and the postal rates went up. So their cost to produce the copy and mail it, um, along with circulation diminished, really sort of let them down a bad path. The general magazines that survived usually were the women's magazines. But contrary to that, we had the People magazine, which was launched in 74. And it was really the first successful magazine this kind of decade because it really did um, focus on celebrities, music, pop culture. I want to call it the TMZ of its time because people really had um, a very big audience. It was also placed in, you'd buy it in airports, they'd have it in doctor's offices. It was one of those that you could see the imagery plus the stories that people really did like. So here's the top 10 uh, magazines in two, 1972 versus 2017. You can see that Reader's Digest was up there with uh, almost 18 million. TV Guide had about 16.4 million. Women's Day, 8 million, um, almost 8 million on Better Homes and Gardens. Family Circle, National Geographic, um, again, Playboy, actually in 1972, had about 6 million um, circ circulation in terms of the whole country, obviously, but I don't know what it was. I assume that's just national. It may not have been worldwide. Uh, and then good housekeeping was in there with almost 6 million. So you fast forward to 2017, you have the art magazine for the retired people, the bulletin and the magazine both have about um, 24 million in terms of a circulation. 
one that I like, again, Costco Connection has about a almost 13 million circulation. And part of the reason they do that is they don't do any advertising anywhere else besides their own magazine and tout their product, uh, products. They also do just send up advertising flyers on their own. So they do not take ads anywhere else. And Better Homes and Gardens was up there about 7.6 million. The big one for your generation would be Game Informer from GameStop that that was up there with about 7.5 million. And then AAA from a card there, Living Magazine, and then Good Housekeeping, Family Circle People was up there in 2017, still with about um, 3,400. And Women's Day is still at, at 3 million. So they're still, they still are profitable, but they're not what they were in their, in their age. So the convergence, really, the magazines did confront the digital age. The magazines moved online. So again, the magazine would have a companion website for the increasing reach of the consumer magazine. Some were starting to do paywalls with their online, too. And again, they would have um, original, on or original content. They also had more space, obviously, online versus the, um, the limited space you would have in a magazine. So the magazines did embrace the digital content, and the webzines made the internet legitimate site for breaking news and discussing um, culture and politics. I think of Rolling Stone as one of my favorites as a magazine that I did subscribe to that now has a huge online presence and it gets linked to Facebook all the time. And I don't know how many, what their circulation is at this point, but they do have a pretty big web presence too. So I'm assuming that Rolling Stone is still profitable because it does politics and music, which was two of my favorite things really. So, so the domination and the specialization, the magazines are usually grouped by two important characteristics what kind of advertiser type that they have. So it could be consumer, it could be business or trade, it could be farm. And again, they would target the demographics, the gender, the age or ethnic group, or the audience, um, interest areas, sports, literature, tabloids. Um, the business trade always um, sort of hits me because I had a friend that worked in, his father worked in machine tools and there was a machine tool magazine that was nationwide that was published in Cincinnati. And I did interview once with them to become a, an editor for one of the publications, but it was actually based, the owner was based in Europe, but it was intriguing because you wouldn't think that there would be a big circulation on that kind of thing, but the circulation that they had, the advertisers wanted to be in that magazine. Farm magazines too, when you think about it, they have a certainly a pretty big scope in terms of rural areas. Um, advertisers can, could include John Deere, those kind of thing, whatever, seed companies, all that stuff. So all these magazines are really sort of um, targeted in terms of the, the age, the ethnic group. And again, you could even say politically in some cases. Um, sports and literature and tabloids also are other ones too. The sports one seems to have shifted to ESPN online as opposed to Sports Illustrated and even um, the battle back and forth between those two. Sports Illustrated doesn't have the same clout that it did now that every, all this, any sports you want is actually online. So. Magazines are also broken um, down by target audience. Again, men and women, sports, entertainment, leisure, age group specific. Elite magazines, usually cultural minorities, and again, minorities. And then the supermarket tabloids, which are my favorite, like National Enquirer and some of those. Um, again, they sort of push the limits of decency and credibility, but they are kind of fun to look at. So um, National Enquirer in, in particular, or the Weekly Daily News, whatever, they're, they're always sitting there. The ones that say, you know, alien baby, birth by Hillary Clinton or something like that. That's the kind of stuff you usually see in those, but they're, they're kind of fun, but again, how seriously can we take them is the question. So how do the departments work? Again, very similar to what we would have in books or journalism. Again, you have a, a publisher and editor in chief, managing editor and sub editors. The sub editors oversee photography, illustrations, reporting and writing, copy editing, layout and print and multiple media design. This is something I wish I had done if I'd gone to New York City and tried to work for a publishing firm or for a magazine, I would have liked to have overseen the photography and writing both. So again, also production and technology. So computer and printing hardware, which changed over time, because when I got out of school the first time, again, our printing was still done <clears throat> non-electronic static imagery, which we have now, where it's basically, you just basically lay out whatever you want in, in um, Photoshop for your images, or in design that you're using, say, for example, for the software that you would have for some sort of publication you're putting out. And then that goes to a production facility, either in a um, PDF form or whatever, in terms of how they would, would transmit it to actually be published. So that really, the, the process has changed and made it much, much simpler. There's no question in terms of the printing. 
So the other part would be the, of the departments would be the advertising sales. So they would secure the clients, arrange promotion, place ads. Um, they would have rate cards and have ad size, sizes and prices. And again, this is with the internet, this has changed a lot because we have so much more room. Um, and again, the advertising on the internet usually is a little bit different than it would be in terms of actual um, tabloid style space. So the publishers began introducing different editions to attract advertisers. And again, they would have regional editions, national magazines of content tailored to interests of different geographic areas. You have one for the West Coast, one for the East, one in the middle, however you wanted to do it. Split run editions, the magazine remains the same, but has a few pages of ads by local or regional companies. You could do that. Or demographic editions where the magazines, they target particular groups, consumers identified by their occupation, class, zip code. So somebody in Mason might get a different magazine than somebody in Hamilton. It would be that kind of deal in terms of how they could target it. The other thing would be the circulation and distribution. Again, they monitor single copy and subscription sales. And again, the subscriptions are usually, again, paid up front. The evergreen um, subscriptions are considered those that are automatically renewed on a credit card unless the subscriber tries to um, stop it. And again, those like, they want those similar, like in, when you have insurance, they want to have the residuals keep coming and coming and coming. If you have somebody who has an account, same thing with subscriptions. Again, they're usually controlled now and then the digital ones um, again, it changes in terms of the price versus the magazine and digital, but we obviously know that most of these uh, magazines have a, ma a web presence and they do want to sell both. Washington Post says a newspaper does the same thing, where they're always trying to get you to do a dollar a week or whatever it is. Again, the same kind of deal that we do with the magazines, only have a little bit of higher price. So the magazine change, which we'll get into um, when you look at your media, media um, conglomerate that you want to write about. Time is still the largest magazine change in the United States. Um, advanced Publications, which is Condé Nast, that's the force and upscale magazine, a lot of those in New York City. We've got many Miami uh, graduates working for um, Advanced Publications in Condé Nast. Hearst Corporation, which was founded by William Randolph Hearst. And again, it publishes um, Cosmopolitan, LO, all those sort of a, the female focused magazines. And then Meredith Corporation also specializes in women's home related magazines, some of the big ones, Home and Gardens, that kind of stuff. Rodale is one that's um, famous for doing health and wellness titles. I think they have a lot of things about um, vitamins and health thing issues and stuff, stuff like that. You'll see a lot of those magazines are published by them. And many of the American magazines have carved out sort of a global niche too. So they're not just um, national in terms of that. A lot of these magazines go worldwide. And again, many of the publishers, they do operate custom publishing divisions. So they might do um, Magalogs, which is a glossy magazine style with the sales picture retail catalog. We see a lot of that stuff going on with, um, again, when I mentioned Cornerstone here in Butler County, those kind of things. So it's used to market goods or services to customers or employees. So you see more and more of those as they come about today. Here's a little bit of the circulation reach of some of the leading American magazines. And again, you can go through the, this yourself in terms of taking a look at it, but you can see where they have the total brand versus video versus mobile versus web and print and digital. So I think it's kind of great that they actually delineate this in smaller categories since it's much better data to work with. But you can see like ESPN, the magazine, the total brand, they have a, a pretty big audience. And I assume this is in millions too. They don't have a little content box here to say what the, the numbers are. But again, People's up there, Web MD Magazine, Time, ARP, and all recipes, better homes and gardens. So you can see the brand, total brand usually is what you wanna look at in terms of how they're doing across the board here. Alternative voices would be considered alternative magazines. They've um, defined themselves mostly through politics like we had City Beat here in um, Cincinnati, which could be considered sort of a little bit of a tabloid um, magazine, not really news, more magazine. And again, the zines are, are self-published magazines. And a lot of these, um, again, usually at academic um, universities will have people might publish a particular one for the art department or for, you know, even students in the literature, they usually have some sort of self-published magazine to put out their um, work and see what they've done. So this is still pretty popular in some respects across the board too. But again, it costs to actually print. The printing cost is usually the most expensive part if you do not have advertisers. So some of chief mainstream success, National Re Review and Mother Jones. I can remember when Mother Jones was basically just a, a printed publication and now it's a pretty big web um, presence because it's a success they had from the actual magazine itself. Um, 
another thing to look at, and again, this might be something to think about for essay questions. Again, have magazines really played a central role in transforming the United States from a producer society to a consumer society? If you look from the 1700s on up, you could make a case for that. But the contrary is a diminished national voice today. And again, are we just consumers rather than, you know, producers? And that's a big issue too in itself. So the contemporary magazines, they help us think about ourselves as participants in a, in a democracy, but still you can argue both ways. And again, this is why this is a good essay question. So here's the, the add on about we are viewed as consumers first and often viewed that way by companies um, as consumers first and citizens second. I would prefer it to be the other way around, but magazines are growing increasingly dependent on their advertising. So again, the readers, just viewers and purchases of material goods, they can look at it that way. But good magazines really maintain the connection to the words in an increasingly digital culture. So you can make that argument back and forth. Of, are they out there to give us information and to help society or is it just, oh, we want you to buy everything our advertisers have and, and basically we just want you to, that we have you as a Catholic audience would be a good way to look at it. So think about that, that might actually be an essay on, on the test, we'll have something like that. All right, that's chapter nine. So that wasn't too bad. Thank you.